So you're uh, so and there's no option for formatting that with FAT32. So you could FAT format in FAT32, but that's the most compatible of your choices. So FAT64 is on the list now in your when you go to format a device. So FAT64 has some advantages and some major disadvantages. But uh, it was introduced with the CE devices. And why was it introduced with CE devices? Anybody have an idea here from the picture, maybe? Yeah, it's Flash. It's a, an optimized Flash routine. If anybody's seen any of my previous speeches about Flash, I have this whole big, you know, whole hour animation stuff that shows you how Flash actually works. Uh, and solid state disks, which are IDE emulations, uh, what their functions are, they're different. But let's face it, uh, defragmentation for Flash devices is a bad idea it will kill the cells faster, so there's really no point. So you need an operating system that, that is uh, fundamentally better for flash devices, or you will be killing those. They cannot operate the way you deal with standard hard drives. So this was optimized because all you, know, all you people with uh, you know, CE devices in your hand, Windows phones and things like that, that's what this is using as a basis for some of this to actually protect that to keep it running. I don't know why they released it in Service Pack 1 for Vista, you know, other than maybe to get it out there for some development purposes or something like that. But uh, but anyway, so that's the point, is that its focus is to, do, to make these changes. Um, so, you know, at least, you know, what's good about it, it basically, this is how it's optimized for Flash. It has a free space bitmap. So basically now it knows right away, where's my next thing that I'm actually going to go and shove on this device so I don't have to search through the device for, you know, searching for a hole to actually shove something in. Um, and basically they've upped the ante on everything else. Uh, so that you can store more files in the device. It has ACL support. It has, uh, you guys know, transaction-oriented systems as journaling, basically. Microsoft decides to call everything transaction-oriented. I don't know if they got a little trademark next to it or something, maybe. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> but the transaction-oriented process still isn't implemented in Vista. So even though you can format it, it's not going to use any of those processes. So I'm guessing, again, for development, uh, the downside to things like adding like ACL, the security support in Vista for this, for this process is that that means in the future, let's say Windows 7 completely implements this process. All you got to do is take the device and go back to a Vista Service Pack 1 machine and you can bypass security. In most cases, you can just get the content off the device. So it's kind of bad that they didn't completely implement it. And then you have this other thing, which is this is probably the big thing. If you guys ever make a copy of a DVD, nobody does that, right? So. Uh, <coughs> You have a limitation of four gigs for a file size in FAT, which FAT is still the most compatible. You can take it to a Linux box, a Mac, or whatever, and you can still use it. But, uh, but that's a problem, having a limitation of a four gig. So they've expanded that to 16 exabytes. So I don't know how many people are going to use this. I probably think for a little while it's a bad idea. Till we don't know if it's going to be like patent encumbered and whether or not we're going to be limited. If they decide to release it as a, you know, an, a standard the way that they've published their previous FAT standard, then maybe it'll come into play and other people will be using it. But right now it's there, and it's uh, and some of your clients or people might start using it. Oh, there's EX FAT. I'll format it in that. And when you plug it into another machine, it's not going to be supported. You're not going to see it, and you might just think there's something wrong with the device. If it came from Vista, that should be your first question. Do you have Vista at home? Anyway, just so you know. All right. Well, good. I got two probably so far. That... All right, so now this one is a little more obvious to some people, uh, partitions. So the placement of your partition affects speed directly. And a lot of people don't realize this. So when you're looking at this, now this is just a sample down here at the bottom for people who can't see it, is that uh, the CHS translation formula. Basically what I'm trying to say here is partitions begin on cylinder boundaries. Now most people kind of got this whole picture with cylinders. You have two platters and contents written through them, that's your cylinder. So your heads are in the same location when you're moving, and so typically that's considered the cylinder that goes through the drive. Now, we've virtualized some of that, and we have something called zone tables, but we still respect what's called cylinder boundaries. And for those of you who don't think we're using it anymore because we have LBA, you're incorrect. There's still some translation basically going on in the back end here that translates to what cylinder boundaries are. And so what happens is if you have something like um, it's all for backwards compatibility. When we went to LBA blocks, we did not need to pay attention to cylinder boundaries anymore. However, the problem is old programs like Norton Disk Edit or something like that still respects those cylinder boundaries. So 
if you had Norton Disk Edit and you cracked it open on a newer system, it might actually destroy your partition structure if you were doing something with it. So for legacy concerns, they kept the compatibility, they kept the same standard. So almost every operating system, when they format a disk, and you'll see that, you'll see like a gap between partition structures, and you'll see like a gap at the end of the disk. So you'll see, you know, eight megs or something that's unusable. There's a boundary there so that there's an offset for the beginning of the next partition. So that's just setting you up for what is important with regards to this, because uh, that's not really the, the cool thing itself. But so now, the second piece of this puzzle that we're putting together is that the outside edges of a platter are faster. There's more content out there. The closer you get to the inside of the platters themselves, the closer you get to the in, inner motor, the spindle itself, is going to be slower because there's less content that the heads can read without moving some other location. So that's the other thing that they've done is they put the LBA addresses typically are labeled for the lower number on the outside edges because things count up in LBA numbers. So the logical block addresses for how you're going to write to your sectors and LBA equals sectors, then uh, they're going to start putting that at the beginning of the disk. So the slowest part is going to be inside. So this means if partitions are made on cylinder boundaries and the fastest part is the outside edge, your first partition is going to be the closest to the outside edge. So your second partition is going to be further into the disk by however many megs, gigs that you have set up your first partition to be. So this is kind of the picture of what that looks like. So the, now, and things are a little upside down. Basically in drives, everything's upside down compared to what you're seeing on the screen. So I'm doing this for the beauty of a drive basically to explain it because upside down confuses people. But uh, <clears throat> so, so basically the whole point is the closer you get to the center of that spindle, the more likely your content is going to be to be a lot slower. So, <laughs> I don't know if this is done on purpose or what, but you know, ultimately the whole point is, is that, okay, so let's say you're Mac, you want to install Windows. When it comes, you have an HFS, you have partition, it's already laid out for you. Basically, it goes to the end of the disk and it knobs off where you're going to put this you know, new 32 gig partition. If you're using FAT, it has to be 32 gigs or less. Uh, so, or it'll format it, but in most cases that's going to be the default. So you can actually do a larger partition. But at least from this point of view, you've got this extra space that's out there at the end of the disk and that's where it's going to put the Windows partition. So then you have this, this free space. So ultimately this is true of every operating system and most people just don't realize it. So for instance, when you go to install Linux these days, what's, how many partitions does Linux normally want to make by default now? What's kind of the standard now? Three, Three right? Three. So you get so you get the, your first, your OS, your setup, and then you get your swap file, and you get your user's file. So the third partition is usually the user's files, and that's the slowest part of the disk, right? So that's kind of the, the whole thing right now is that if you just pay attention to a little bit of how you're ordering stuff, so when people are going to do like, I want this uh, database on my disk, and I want it to be as fast as possible, don't make it the third partition. You might want to make it the outside edge, so you want to make it the first partition, and logically you can swap those things around in your formatting process or your installation process and actually make a difference. And, it, and I can prove that this is how this actually works. So now this is, this is a screen most of you will not see or normally be able to have access to. Um, I can see the internals of a drive using a special $13,000 machine. <coughs> So this $13,000 machine can look at the zone tables and break out the content. So a zone table now, you had cylinders, you had LBA blocks, and the LBA blocks count out. Well, they say, okay, the manufacturers say, well, the fastest area, maybe you know, this platter has an area that's faster and this platter has an area that's faster, so let's test those and let's make a table of the fastest spots. So you can see here, what you're looking at here is you have uh, position zero, zone, blah, 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 your start cylinders, and you can see where it starts. It goes from zero to this LBA, and this is going to be on head zero. So when you see that stack of heads, uh, head zero is the bottom, by the way. Everything counts up from the bottom. So you'll see head zero. So zone one is the fastest location on this disk, and I can tell how many that's going to be. Now, for people that can put two and two together on this, that also means that it's only on one side of the platter. So these, all this content is not written down through the disk like it used to be. This content is now written across a platter and initializes a head and then comes back and initializes the next head for the next section that it's going to write. And you can tell where it's going to go in this based on the LBA numbers. So I think that's pretty cool. But you know, it, it'll break it up and it all won't be in the same place. That actually means that I could read a lot of content from one platter that's damaged 
uh, or another platter that's damaged and turn it off. Turn off a head, read the rest of the content, and reassemble some content. But for you guys at home who might want to try this out and actually figure out what the location is that's fastest on your drives or your RAID array or something, there is 